So this is a series of stills from the um, from the from the the film, uh, not from the film actually, taken by the stills photographer. And this is the bus on its side in Whitehall. We we're very lucky to get permission to put that bus there. There's only half of it there actually. The, the top half has been put in afterwards. Um, this isn't. This is Killian just getting used to the rain. It looks very heroic and dramatic. And in fact, it's actually something all the actors did just to stop themselves looking like they were shivering, just to kind of face the rain before a take. A couple of infected. We were very lucky on the film to have the stills photographer Peter Mountain, who took all these with us the whole time. It's always a big decision on a film that financially not to have the stills photographer there the whole time just to bring him in on certain days for big setups but you gain a lot more when he's there the whole time and it's true to say that peter took some wonderful photographs for us and they their value is when you come to publicize the film especially if you don't have a star um or very recognizable face the pictures themselves have to be of a quality that makes a picture editor on a magazine or on a newspaper pick it out and say hey let's run with that uh, you know, and uh, they always say the picture's worth more than a good review in a way. Um, well, I don't know whether that's true or not, but um, um, this is the money scattered in near Buckingham Palace, which is based on, I think I said in the other commentary, on a, a still from uh, uh, Cambodia when they went into, uh, after Pol Pot was driven out of Phnom Penh. This is at Horse Guards. And it's quite interesting, you see uh, celluloid, which these have taken on, obviously. There's much more detail than actually in the digital video that we used in the film. So um, there's one shot in particular, I think, which I hoped here of him in the distance with the soldiers, the statues of the soldiers, which we couldn't use on the digital video because there just wasn't enough resolution that far away from the camera. But um, this one, yeah. But on celluloid, you pick out, your eye goes right in and you can pick out detail. You don't get that with the less resolution. But I love that shot, but we never, we couldn't use it in the film itself. The cenotaph and the soldiers that you're going to get at the end of the film, it's a prefigurement of that, really, I suppose. Um, that's at Bank. And um, road markings, obviously. That will be replaced soon by congestion charging signs, big Cs, Ken's congestion charging. <laughs> Uh, this is the Benetton sign that we had put up. That's um, Miguel and um, I don't know what that, what was that other girl called, something like Helen or something like that, these impossible models um, that we had put up there. That's Killian telling me how to set up my next shot, the next shot of him in the pyjamas. <laughs> And yeah, this is Rome Piccadilly Circus, all the boards that were drawn up for that. Um, and that was an amazing morning light. You see the light on that wall behind. Fantastic light we had that day for it. Beautiful light. Another one of it there. Very, very low light kicking in. And Thomas the gaffer was using a kickboard to flash light around everywhere because Anthony, our cinematographer, wasn't there that day. He had to go back. Uh, to Copenhagen, so we shot that sequence without him, in fact. There's the catastrophe of crows above Parliament. That's meant to symbolise the end of government or the monarch's about to be beheaded, isn't it, when the catastrophe of clo clo crows flies round Parliament. I wish uh, more of Parliament, yeah. These shots do help enormously in... Uh, in trying to sell the film, in, in, in position, what they call positioning the film, really, this intriguing idea of a deserted London. Uh, this is uh, meant to be St Thomas's Hospital, though we shot it somewhere else. It's actually shot at uh, a hospital uh, in Acton, an NHS hospital in Acton, a brand new day hospital there. Um, and they make money by allowing film crews in to film at the weekends, because they're day hospitals, they work Monday to Friday, they do day operations and people leave, and they make money for the hospital by allowing film crews in at the weekend. It's a very organised system, and, a, and you think it's fantastic, right? Giving the money directly to a hospital like that is great. This is uh, Finding the Dead, and all those people are um, alive, in fact, or virtually all of them are alive. They were students and friends who came in for a few hours, 
and uh, promised to lie down for us and um, act dead. That's Selena and her uh, Naomi with her um, Lurex top, sparkling top, which is Rachel Fleming's idea, the costume designer, to get a bit of kick on the light in a very subdued scene, although it looks very bright there in the actual film, it's very subdued. Tower blocks and shopping trolleys on their way up to eventually meet Frank and Hannah. That tower block now, uh, where we shot this, is actually uh, has been pulled down. And when we went there to film, there was a... Um, these are all um, bits from it. Um, the, the caretaker of the place was allowing people to sleep, presumably for a fee, in the bottom of the tower block, because we suddenly went into this room and there were like 10 or 15 sleeping bags laid out of uh, people. Nobody was there. They were all out working, I guess, but they were all sleeping the, the night there. They had little homes there. And he must have been just renting it out, really, to make money on the side from, I guess, refugees, illegal immigrants or, pe or homeless people who had managed to get a bit of cash together and to find somewhere dry to sleep. It's since been pulled down. The whole film was supposed to be um, candlelit, really, as there's no electrical light left other than kind of the odd batteries, car batteries here and there like that. Um, and it's obviously a very nice, flattering way to... Um, be lit. This is on the on the roof of the tower block in uh, in uh, at the mouth of the block at the north mouth of the Blackwall Tunnel in London, and uh, it's fantastic looking down on London from on high really as a city, um, which you can get with a London eye. This is meant to be the Blackwall Tunnel, but we did it in uh, a disused. Well, it, it hadn't yet opened a, a little cut off tunnel in the uh, Limehouse Link. Um, that we were allowed to get into and build our um, our traffic kind of collision there, and the infected running through. Peter's uh, a photographer that we've had a relationship with for quite a long time, really, and he's um, a wonderful guy to have on the set. Um, he is very um, in tune with what's going on, so. You barely ever notice him there, and yet he's getting photographs. Wish he obviously hadn't taken that one, but he gets very valuable photographs. Um, this was a big setup that we never used, and one of the reasons was that we didn't use a proper crane, of course, so the camera was juddering when it went up there, and so the shot was unusable, really. That's sort of an example of trying to save money by you not using the right equipment and actually getting caught out in the end. This is the full body burn. This is stunt men and women, there's one guy and one woman there who do full body burns um, as a way of making a living. This is an incredible way of making a living if you think about it, but um, it's a big thank you to them. There's our Spearmint Rhino background poster, which we were gonna have the Spearmint Rhino on the side of the cab, actually. You see them on the sides of cabs and we were gonna have that throughout, but it was felt to be too intrusive, too distracting. I don't know why people would think that would be distracting. And, uh, yeah, Killian fleeing the petrol bombs, or running towards the petrol bombs, as it turns out. Yeah, so it's very... Um, if you can afford it when you're making a film, to have a photographer there the whole time is so important. It's only... It, and even if they get on your nerves, which photographers can do, because, you know, you're trying to just get the moving pictures rather than the still ones, you, it's afterwards that you realise the value of it to present the film. This is the kind of shot that the studio wants because they always want the two shots of the main actors, you know, looking wistfully at each other or kissing or stuff like that. Um, but having him there the whole time allows him to get more graphic, um, more visual pictures rather than just portrait shots of actors, really, which are important, which are valuable. People want to see that. It's this kind of way that the slowly the drip, drip, the audience begin to get to know a face that's in a film um, as Megan pretending to drive the cab. Um, but having the photographer there the whole time allows you to not just have to tick off the list of portraits of the main actors, but it can get some visually interesting shots as well. Because he spends the whole day just taking photographs of the... Um, 
of what's happening that day, the different setups. And some of them are live in the actual take. He uses a special camera that doesn't make a click, doesn't make a sound as the shutter opens and closes. Um, so it doesn't distract the actors. So he can actually photograph during live takes, if you see what I mean. Though sometimes they have to photograph rehearsals or special setups that you do after the shot has been done. They prefer not to do that because it, the actors are never quite as engaged as they are when they're actually doing the, the real take. Oh, there's Anthony Dodd-Mantle, centre stage, our cinematographer, um, with his um, duvet on, his portable duvet, which comes from Canada, I believe, and kind of set you alight eventually. Spontaneous combustion is so warm. There he is again, showing me how wide his veranda is on, back home in Copenhagen. Um, it's very important to, with a photographer, that the... Do you have somebody organising to make sure that the photographer gets what the publicity need? And that was done by Sarah Clark on this film. Again, is somebody, a uh, fantastic woman that we've worked with a number of times who has uh, organised and set up the smooth interaction of what the publicity needs and what the film is desperately trying to get before time runs out. And it's a sort of uh, an invisible and unacknowledged presence in a film, but very important, really. Jim and his baseball bat. Don't know why I told you that. You can see that unless you can't see it. And Peter did some very interesting colorizing on them um, because he's working in a digital medium. He digitizes the photographs and he enhances the colour or changes the colour. So, for instance, in this, it's obviously... He's changed it to red, because that jacket that Killian's wearing is, in fact, a dark green. And, obviously, the trees would be dark green back there, and he's colourised it red, really, to give it an offbeat look. We were going to do some of that kind of work in the film to give this film a strange look. Um, because it's the end of the world. Who knows what everything would look like without pollution or, you know... Um, but we decided not to in the end. Is it's The danger with them is they're always a little bit self-conscious. And there is Anthony, once again, looking <laughs> very self-conscious. No, it's um, with the tiny little camera, you have all this equipment to hold it up, and the actual DV camera is actually, in the end, quite small. It's not one of those monstrous 35mm cameras that you normally see. And there's us just setting up... Um, different angles really we would run around setting up the cameras and leaving them in different places really to record odd moments that's a an example of it you just leave it on a box and just leave it set there there's simon and marcel helping out there can't quite see what that is actually is he falling backwards i don't think we shot him or he looks like he's i don't know what he's doing there chris eccleston Noble in the rain. We had fantastic rain and um, we spent a lot of money and a, a lot of the skill of the guys setting up the rain for us to achieve that really thick, sexy rain, really, which you sort of is part of the diet that Hollywood establishes, really, in thrillers and particularly in thrillers, noirish things. And is often, in British films, is often a disappointment because you simply cannot afford normally the amount of money you have to spend on the rain. This is one of the photographs that was based on some of those terrible graves that were found in Bosnia in the, um, in the 90s. Ricky and Killian. This sequence where he eventually puts his eyes out, there was also a terrible battering, fist battering, which went on before they took his eyes out. And we cut that from the film because it just felt too much, really. Um, I'm sure people will be as surprised to hear that, but uh, because the end itself is very graphic and violent, but we did reduce it down considerably to, compared to what we shot as a measure so that it took you somewhere but didn't kind of obliterate your senses, really. This is a 
one of my favourite photographs. It's much darker in the uh, than it's than it's shown here. So turn your sets down. But it's a beautiful, evocative moment between the two of them. I really love that photograph, though I never saw it used actually in any of the press and publicity. Probably too dark. They they tend to like for newspapers and magazines, not so much magazines, but certainly newspapers. They tend to like the um, subjects to be well lit um, and very clear, so the information is conveyed very simply and cleanly really loved this particular again this should be much darker it's uh, this blue room which was just as we found it really we mark tilsley dressed it up with a few toys and stuff like that but it was a child's room that we found at the house in salisbury and gives a very weird cold moment in it as marvin as mailer amongst his sheets in the pit at salisbury well um we had to, there was a lot of asbestos in this place which had to be cleared out of these lower rooms. Um, that was a bit scary, um, seeing them clear that out, sealing everything off and sucking all the atmosphere out of these lower rooms that might have asbestos hanging around in it. Back to the um, Blackwall Tunnel, which what was meant to be the Blackwall Tunnel and the escape in the cab and another full body burn and the chase, and you'd have, with something like that, because it's so dangerous and difficult for them to do, and they can only burn for a few seconds, you have like four or five cameras on that, so that he only has to do it, ideally he only has to do it once. And indeed, they're paid stuntmen. They're paid per burn, or per jump, if they do a big jump, and you have to say rightly so, because um, it's a small amount for, to pay for something that effective. Again, back to Killian behind that truck, <laughs> waiting to lure the guy to his death. Here's Justin, um, plays the child in it, and did it. Was very brave doing this. It was timed out by Nick Powell, our uh, stunt arranger. The timing between the two of them had to be just perfect so that nobody got hurt during it. This is a beautiful room in the, in the house in Salisbury with this tableau painted all the way around it. It had a special name, this room, but I can't remember it now. We have to be very careful not to, nobody's allowed to touch the walls in any way in case they damage the paintings. There's the London Eye and um, this is mostly waiting time really while we were trying to wait to set up um, to stop the traffic and to set up our takes. So there's a lot of photographs of that because Peter had a lot of time where he could just take photographs and there were no cars in it. 